welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 30 of the Madden America podcast. This week we interview journalist and author Johan Hari. Johan is one of our foremost social science thinkers and writers. In addition to writing regularly for the New York Times and independent newspapers, he has written extensively on social science and human rights issues. His 2015 book, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs, challenges what we know about addiction, and his TED Talk on our response to addiction has been viewed over 20 million times. Johan was twice named National Newspaper Journalist of the Year by Amnesty International, and he has been named Cultural Commentator of the Year and Environmental Commentator of the Year at the Comment Awards. In this interview, we talk about Johan's latest book, Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions, which has been called a game-changer and received plaudits for its explanation of the social and cultural issues leading to depression and anxiety. Johan, welcome. I'm delighted to be able to talk with you today for the Madden America podcast. And to begin, I wanted to ask about your own background and what led to your interest in journalism and your work as an author. Yeah, it's lovely to be with you, James. Thanks very much. Yeah, I I was the product of a (laughs) funny uh, uh, inception. My parents, my, my dad's from the Swiss mountains, which is why I have this slightly strange name, despite being obviously British. And my mum's from a kind of working class part of Scotland. And they both, uh, they collided in London in the 1960s. They they lived uh, next door to each other. And they, they my dad didn't speak any English. My mother didn't speak any um, German or French. And they had what my mother calls a series of one night stands, which is a concept I've tried to explain to her does not make sense. And uh, she ended up getting pregnant. They thought they had to get married. And uh, then my dad learned English and she always bursts into tears and says, he seems so nice when I couldn't understand what he was saying. (laughs) They're still together 50 years later. They still don't really speak the same language in any meaningful sense. But, uh, you know, uh, weirdly uh, sort of happy. And, uh, yeah, so I've been a journalist for a long time. um, And I I wrote a book uh, called Chasing the Scream, which was about um, addiction and the war on drugs. And, and, And I've got this new book that's just come out called Lost Connections, Uncovering the real causes of depression and the unexpected solutions. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I wrote this book, it was very personal. Um, although the book is, is, is not a memoir or anything like that. The reason I wanted to write the book was this very personal one. Uh, There were these two kind of mysteries that were really hanging over me and I wanted to understand the answer to, but I was also quite frightened of looking into. It's a sign of how, it's a sign of how reluctant I was to look into this. I actually wanted to start writing this book seven years ago. And instead, I decided to write a book that required me to go and spend time with the Mexican drug cartel. (laughs) That's how reluctant I was. So I spent three years really deeply researching these these mysteries. The first mystery was, why was I still depressed? Mm. I was a teenager. I'd gone to my doctor and I'd said I had this feeling like pain was kind of leaking out of me and and I couldn't regulate it and I couldn't control it and I couldn't understand it. And my doctor told me a story. My doctor said, there's this chemical called serotonin in people's brains. Some people are naturally lacking it. You're clearly one of them. If we give you this drug, it'll boost your serotonin levels and you know, you'll feel fine. And I felt a tremendous sense of relief to be told this story. Mm. And when I started taking the drugs, I remember the first morning I took them uh, in, in, in outside a shopping center in, in North London. I remember it felt like a kind of chemical kiss, but this immediate relief. Um, which of course can't be due to the drug because no drug works like that and kick in immediately. Um, and, and I felt tremendous relief to have been given a story for why I felt this way. And for several months I felt significantly better. And then this sense of pain kind of came back in. So I went back to my doctor. My doctor said, we haven't given you a high enough dose clearly. So he gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt relief. Again, the pain came back. Again, he gave me a higher dose and we kind of continued in that pattern until I was taking the maximum possible dose with a few short breaks for 13 years. And at the end of all of that, after 13 years, the question I was left with is, why do I still feel depressed? Mm. I've done everything this story is telling me to do. But the bigger and more important question for me was, why are there so many other people like me? You know, one in 11 British people are taking are so distressed they feel the need to take an antidepressant to get through the day. There are lots more people who are depressed and anxious who are not taking these drugs. One in five Americans is taking a psychiatric drug from the fact that we, you know, 
drug kids to make them compete at school. So we drug old people with antipsychotics so they don't shout at the just the, the horrible way they're being treated in old people's homes to in between one in four middle-aged women taking an antidepressant at any given time. And, 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 and one thing that really struck me was I began to think, well, can it really be that so many people's brains are just experiencing some kind of chemical imbalance? And why would there have been such a huge increase in the last 30 years, right? Can it really be that people's brains just start to spontaneously malfunction over 30 years? And I wanted, to, I wanted to understand what was really going on. So I ended up going on this big, long journey across 40,000 miles. I interviewed the leading scientists in the world about what causes depression and anxiety. Uh, and also that led me to realize there's a very different way we might be responding to them. But also I went to places that just have really different perspectives on depression from, you know, a, um, an Amish village in Indiana, because there's this really interesting evidence the Amish have unusually low levels of depression, to uh, a city in Brazil where they had banned all advertising to see if that would reduce, make people feel better. You know, a lab in Baltimore where they were giving people a component in magic mushrooms to see if it would make them feel better. And I think, I, I mean, I learned a huge amount on this journey. One was the first thing, and this was very challenging for me and very difficult, was that the story I had been told about my depression by my doctor is not true. There is no evidence that depression is caused by a spontaneous chemical imbalance in people's brains. Professor Andrew Scarlett Princeton says that it is, these were his words, deeply misleading and unscientific to say that low serotonin causes depression. Um, the World Health Organization has said, uh, the, the UN, looking at the best evidence, surveyed, you know, surveyed the best evidence and said we need to talk less about chemical imbalances, more about power imbalances, said that this biomedical model of thinking about these problems is based on a misreading of the science. I found that really challenging. And to understand it, I ended up really learning that there are these, I could find scientific evidence for nine causes of depression, yes. two of which are biological, seven of which are factors in the way we are living. And then I learned about seven kind of what I would regard as alternative antidepressants, which are ways of dealing with those causes of depression. I was forced to think in a, in a very different way both about my own pain and about the pain that's rising all around us. Well, Johan, I just wanted to thank you for writing Lost Connections because it's a powerful indictment of how we currently respond to distress and trauma, but also offers real hope for the future. And I'd like to come on to ask about some of the specifics in the book, but Firstly, you mentioned in the book the 13 or so years that you spent taking antidepressant drugs and that you, like many others and like me for a time, were captured by the brain disease model of anxiety and depression. And I just wondered, if you look back on those times, are you bitter about the time that you spent on the drugs? And is the book a catharsis in terms of sharing your learning with others? I wouldn't say I was... It's an interesting question. I wouldn't say I was bitter about it. I wouldn't phrase it like that. In retrospect, given everything I learned, um, so I'll give you, I'll give you a specific example, and we can go into this in much more detail if you want, but I, and this was the hardest part of the research for me, I learned all this evidence that Dr. Vincent Felitti, an incredible scientist I got to know in San Diego, has gathered that, for example, childhood trauma makes you far more likely to become depressed and suicidal as an adult. In fact, if you have a severely traumatic childhood, you're 3,100% more likely to attempt suicide as an adult. You're 4,600% more likely to grow up to be an adult injecting drug user. And I can <clears throat> talk a bit about how he discovered, I think the story of how he discovered this, which I tell in the book, is, is an amazing story. And I, I, had, I had experienced some quite extreme acts of violence when I was a child from an adult in my life in, in terrible circumstances. And I had never connected that with my depression until much later in my life. And... One thing that I felt quite strongly was that it was disgusting that as a teenager, I had a doctor who didn't say to me, who never once said, is there any reason you might feel this way? Mm -hmm. now, I think I, I might have been so cauterized from the, the, the uh, distress and trauma of that, that I'm not sure I would have been able to talk about it, if, to be candid. But it struck me. So what we've been told is that our depression and anxiety are pathologies. They're irrational misfirings. And one of the things that connected all the different causes of depression that I learned about is actually the realization that far from being pathologies, these are perfectly understandable and natural responses. Um, that they're not, if you're depressed and anxious, you're not a machine with broken parts. You're a human being with unmet needs. You know, everyone knows obviously that every human being has natural physical needs. You need, you know, 
food, water, clean air, uh, you know, the right temperature. If I took any of those things away from you, you would be in trouble very, very quickly. There's equally strong evidence going right back to the 50s that human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel you're safe. You need to feel that your life has meaning and purpose. And our culture is really good at lots of things, and I'm glad to be alive now. But there's really important evidence that our culture is getting less and less good at meeting people's underlying psychological needs. And this is one of the key reasons why we have a depression and anxiety and addiction crisis. And so I wouldn't say, I don't think bitter is the right word, but I feel indignant that so many people are being told that this perfectly the explicable and understandable distress is a pathology due to broken biology. Now, there are biological contributors to depression and anxiety. I write about them in the book. There are, and it's important to stress, there are some people who deny there are biological components. They're wrong. The biological components are real and they make up a significant aspect of the contribution to it. They make you significantly more sensitive to these problems. Um, and, that, and that's really important to stress. But the main drivers are so are to be found in the way we live. And I do think, I think it's really immoral to tell people that uh, their depression is just a kind of chemical malfunction. Firstly, because it's not true, and the science is really clear on that. It's not true, and you shouldn't tell people things that aren't true. But more than that, what it does is it divorces people from finding the roots of their pain. It puts you, a, a wonderful doctor called Rufus May, he, he's uh, very strongly involved in the Healing Voices Net uh, Hearing Voices Network, really great guy. Um, but, but Rufus put it to me very well. He says, what this biological story does, firstly... It puts you at war with yourself, right? You can't get out of your brain, right? Your brain, you are your brain, right? So it puts you at permanent war with a, a core part of yourself. But secondly, I think what it does is it, it divorces you from finding the actual sources of your depression in your life. Because there's, all the evidence is the sustainable way out of depression is for us to challenge and remove the things that are causing that depression in the first place. Um, and one, this is a trivial way of putting it, but one thing I kept thinking about, as you know, I spend a lot of my time in the US. And one thing that's always shocking to Europeans when we're in the United States is the existence of indigestion pills, right? So, you know, you'll, you'll be eating and some perfectly normal person will offer you an indigestion pill. And, you, and, you, and, and as a European, you say, but, but wait, indigestion is a signal that you're, from your body that you're eating too fast, right? The, 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 that's, that's not a malfunction. That's a function, right? You want to you wanna listen to that because if you, if, you get rid, if you ignore that feeling or you try to eradicate it or blunt it, you will actually eat too fast. You'll have a stomach ache. You'll put on weight. You'll, you'll be ill. And in, now, obviously, depression is infinitely more um, agonizing than in, in, than in digestion, as I know very well from my own life. But actually, I came to think that, and I think the evidence is very clear, that depression is not a malfunction. It's a signal that our needs are not being met and that we need to change the way we live so that far more people have their needs met. And that's something we can only do together. It's not something that should be left to the depressed individual. It's something we have to all do together. Absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it? Because psychiatry does lay claim to the biopsychosocial model of mental illness. But actually, as Lost Connections points out so well, evidence of interventions outside of the biological is very difficult to find in mainstream medicine, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, it's worth just explain, unpacking that for people. So the, the biopsychosocial model is the idea that, which is indisputably true, that there are three kinds of causes of depression and anxiety and, and wider mental health phenomena. So there are biological causes, which are obviously things like your genes, brain changes, and there are real brain changes during depression that I write about. They should not be described as a chemical imbalance. That's, that's not what they are, but there are real brain changes. And then there's psychological um, factors, which are how you think about yourself, the patterning of your thoughts and so on. And then there are social factors, um, which are the wider way we live together as human beings. And in one sense, nothing I'm saying should be controversial in that this is just absolutely, I mean, there are, there are plenty of aspects of what I say, which are not agreed on by all, all scientists, obviously, but the biopsychosocial model is, ab should, you know, is the theoretical underpinning for virtually all psychiatry in the Western world. And yet, as Professor Lawrence Kiermaier put it to me when I went to go and see him in Montreal, there's kind of lip service paid to the biopsychosocial model, but actually, overwhelmingly, psychiatrists tell patients a biological story and they offer treatment, which is, has some value, but is not very effective for most, for the, for most people. 
um, for only the biological aspect. You know, so basically you're told something's wrong with your brain, we'll give you a load of pills. Exactly what I was told. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really wanted to look at was people who were approaching this in a different way. Firstly, there are lots of psychiatrists who are uncomfortable with the fact that those are the only tools they've been given. And I'm not especially critical of them. If if all the tools we're giving them are to drug people, well, you know, they shouldn't tell people a full story. But, you know, I understand why if all you've got is one lever to pull or a couple of levers because we, you know, um, a little bit of therapy, a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever, um, then, you know, that's okay. That's the only lever they've got to pull when they're confronted with distressed people. And lots of them are uncomfortable with that reality and lots of them know better. Um, but the, so one person who really inspired me, I met many amazing people researching lost connections. One of the people I most loved was this doctor in East London called Dr. Sam Everington. So Sam runs a general practice, co-runs a general practice in a poor part of East London. It's actually somewhere I lived for a long time. And Sam, um, Sam was really uncomfortable because he had loads of patients coming to him who were depressed and anxious. And he'd been told to tell them they had a chemical imbalance in their brains and offer them, you know, drugs and at that time that wouldn't even have been particularly other forms of therapy now it'd be a little bit better Mm. and sam just thought when he spoke to them about their lives that their depression made sense their pain made sense they were socially isolated they were lonely they were often very insecure and he just thought he's not like me he's not you know opposed to chemical antidepressants but he just thought this is not adequate to the problem and, and so he pioneered this different approach, which he called social prescribing. So there's this really interesting evidence. Um, another person I interviewed, um, Professor John Cassiopo, has really show, proven that loneliness causes depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, not just that it's a symptom of it, but that it actually is one of the causal factors. And, and Sam could really see that playing out. So it's not the only thing that's going on, but he could see that loneliness was a big factor. So he did this experiment. There was a patient he had called Lisa Cunningham who'd been shut away in her home for seven years with chronic depression and anxiety. And he said to Lisa, I'll carry on prescribing you the drugs if you want, but I'm also going to prescribe you to take part in a group. There was a patch of land behind the doctor's surgery that everyone called Dog Shit Alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like. It was just scrub land where dogs used to go and shit. But it backed onto a park. What Sam said was to this group of about 20 depressed and anxious people, we'll give you support to do this, but will you guys just meet a couple of times a week and turn this into something beautiful. Just learn gardening, turn it into something beautiful. So this group of people, I mean, Lisa described to me the first time she went, she was just sick with anxiety, physically sick with anxiety. She hadn't spoken to people in years. And just very slowly, so they had a space where they could meet to talk about something other than their depression and anxiety. And in this space, they begin to literally get their fingers in the soil. There's a lot of evidence that which I go through in the book, scientific evidence that that actually exposure to the natural world is a very powerful antidepressant. They get their fingers in the soil, they start learning gardening, they get something's wrong, some things don't grow, some things grow really well. And as the months and then years went by, the way Lisa put it to me, as the the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. And and there was a very interesting study of a a comparable program in, in Norway that found that it was twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. And I think the reason why is really clear because it's dealing with the reasons why they were depressed and anxious. What we've been doing up to now is trying to blunt the symptoms of the depression and anxiety. I'm not saying there's no value in that. I, people I love are on antidepressants, chemical antidepressants. I'm not urging them to stop, especially in a society with so many causes of depression all around them. But that's not enough. We need to. I don't want to take anything off the menu, but we need to radically expand the menu of options available to depressed and anxious people. I think social prescribing is one really terrific example but there's lots of others as well going back to your question about you know whether we're bitter about what you you know you you and i experienced one thing i find frustrating is if you had a drug if tomorrow a drug was discovered that was twice as effective as the already existing chemical antidepressants i can guarantee you the drug companies would be all over it that gardening program and the evidence from therapeutic horticulture there is very there's some good studies but there's there is not a huge industry all over it, right? Why is that? It's for an obvious reason. It's a $10 billion industry around chemical antidepressants, and you're not going to make much money sending Lisa out to go gardening and reconnect with people. So we've ended up with this very skewed body of um, you know, thought on this, where I think it would be fair to say more than 95% of the research has gone into this one area that can be monetized, chemical antidepressants, when actually the, the even more promising areas 
which I go through in the book, the seven alternative antidepressants, have had an absolutely paltry amount of money spent on, on how we roll them out. Well, you reminded me, actually, that you relate in the book the phrase better than well in relation to Prozac. And I found that phrase quite chilling because it came across as advertising industry involvement in healthcare. Yeah, Peter Kramer, Dr. Peter Kramer came up with that phrase. He wrote the first big bestseller on, about antidepressants called Listening to Prozac. I interviewed him. So he had initially said, um, he invented this concept that actually antidepressants don't just make you not depressed, they make you better than well. And um, I, I think he, I, I, I had to say in defense of Peter Kramer, he doesn't take money from the drug companies. That wasn't an advertising slogan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to be, uh, to be fair to Peter Kramer, I think he genuinely believed that. That has now been discredited. There is, I mean, there's so much evidence that's not true. And Peter Kramer, to my, from rather defensively, describes that in his book and doesn't retract it. I found my conversation with Peter Kramer quite chilling, actually. Although I liked him, so he's one of the big defenders of chemical antidepressants, and his defense of it is was so peculiar. So he wrote this book called Ordinarily Well, which has this really good section in it where he basically goes to the places where they do the drug trials for chemical antidepressants. And 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 what Dr. Kramer found is basically the whole thing is just a farce. Because what they have to do is, is private companies who are paid to do it. So they have to track down people who have very specific psychiatric problems. So for example, what we regarded as psychiatric problems. So for example, depression, right? But you have to find someone who is depressed and not anxious. You have to find someone who's depressed that has no other, uh, you know, what are regarded as kind of coexisting, you know, other problems, right? Uh, so you have to find people who are purely depressed. You have to recruit them to come in to take potentially quite dangerous drugs. They don't know what they're taking, obviously. I mean, they're, they're, they are told, but, you know, you, you, I mean, these are trials. So obviously there are uncertainties involved in drug trial. But that's why it's a trial. And you can only pay them, I think it's $40 a day. Mm-hmm. So what Peter Kramer found is basically there's a huge incentive. And so basically what happens is people who are really, really poor and really isolated, are asked, well, do you have only this condition? And there's a very strong incentive for them to say yes, to basically play along. And then they come in and they're given all this wraparound care and they're given, you know, this money and they're given loads of support. And he said there's just an incentive, he witnessed, there's just an incentive for the people to get onto the trial to just say any old rubbish. And there's an incentive because it's so hard to recruit people for the people recruiting for the trials to just overlook the fact that that's what's going on so he says that the trials are largely junk but what i found and i think he makes quite a persuasive case for that but what i found really shocking about that is he says that in defense of the the drugs he says well the trials are all junk that's why you shouldn't listen to the evidence put forward by people like professor irving kirsch which have shown that chemical antidepressants have a real but quite small effect for the vast majority of people so there's something called the hamilton scale so which is how we measure depression I always felt sorry for who, whoever Hamilton was. <laughs> That's how he's remembered by history. But anyway, um, and zero, if you were at zero on the Hamilton scale, you would be, or you would have basically just taken ecstasy. And if you were 59 on the Hamilton scale, you would be suicidal. And to give you a sense of movement on that scale, if you improve your sleep patterns, you get a six point improvement on the Hamilton scale. And what Professor Irvin Kerr showed is that if you look at the real data, not the stuff that's put out by the PR for the drug companies, the average movement when someone starts taking antidepressants is 1.8 points on the Hamilton scale. So it's important to say that's that's over and above placebo. 1.8 points is a, is an effect, right? Um, it's about a third of improving your sleep patterns. And it's worth saying that's the average. Some people have more of that effect and some people have less. So that's I think, is pretty shocking, right? What I conclude from that is that while chemical antidepressants should be one of the things on the menu... They're not going to be the solution for huge numbers of people. My experience, far from being weird, was actually quite typical, I realized when I when I learned all this and looked at these studies. But what Peter Kramer took from that is, well, you just shouldn't believe the clinical trials. But what I what I said to him, and you can listen to the audio on the book's website, is but wait, if if you're saying the trials are junk, how can that be an argument for the drugs? Right? If the trials are junk, that's an argument against them. And I found that very peculiar. And, and, and even uh, Dr. Kramer, you know, who's, who's probably, I think it would be fair to say, the most prominent defender of chemical antidepressants in the world. Even he said to me, well, after 14 weeks, we just don't know very much, right? The effects of these drugs, if you take them for more than 14 weeks, we just don't know very much. And, you know, people like you are quite lucky that you can take them for so long and come off. And I found that really chilling, actually. Funny, I actually found speaking to the defenders of chemical antidepressants more chilling than speaking to the critics in a way. Because in one sense, I was... 
I was hoping for a better defense than that. Mm. Um, and it, it was not to say that Dr. Kramer doesn't make some important points. He does. And, um, and I recommend in the book that people read, you know, for a kind of different perspective, they read, they read his work, but, but I think you're right. And certainly that better than well concept is just totally discredited. No, you won't get any scientists saying that now. Mm. I mean, there were no scientists to my knowledge, apart from Dr. Kramer, who was saying that even in the 90s, but now you wouldn't get anyone saying that. It's funny, isn't it? The discussion around the drugs is so strident and so powerful, it's distorting the conversation. And one of the things I love about Lost Connections is it spends a great deal of time talking about the social and community-based responses to emotional distress and what we might need to do as a society to reduce the impact of the frankly startling increase in numbers of those struggling with depression and anxiety. Yeah, you know, there was someone who really helped me to reframe thinking about this. Um, well, loads of people, but there's one person who came to mind while you were saying that. There's this wonderful South African psychiatrist called Derek Sommerfeld. And Derek happened to be in Cambodia in the early part of this century when chemical antidepressants were first released in Cambodia, first marketed in Cambodia. And the Cambodian doctors there asked him what they were, because they didn't, they didn't know, obviously. And he told them, and they said, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And Derek said to them, what do you mean? And they told him a story. There was a farmer who'd worked in the community who one day had stood on a landmine. He worked in the rice fields and he stood on a landmine and his leg was blown off. So they gave him an artificial limb and he went back to work in, in the fields. But it's apparently very painful to work underwater when you've got an artificial limb. And I'm guessing it was pretty traumatic because the guy had just the guy had been blown up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he became depressed, classic depression, crying all day and so on. And they said to Derek, so we gave him an antidepressant. And Derek said, what did, you, what did you do? He thought they were going to talk about some kind of herbal remedy. And they said, well, we went and sat with him. We listened to his, I'm mean, paraphrasing, this is how Derek paraphrased it to me. We went and sat with him. We listened to his problems. We realized why he felt this way. And we figured if he became a dairy farmer, he wouldn't have to go into the fields. He wouldn't be so distressed. He'd probably feel better. So we bought him a cow and he became a dairy farmer. And within a few weeks, his depression was gone. And they said to Derek, so you see, doctor, that cow was an antidepressant. Now, if you've been raised to think the way we have about depression and anxiety and wider mental health problems, that they're due to biological breaks in your brain, that sounds like a bad joke, right? You imagine going to the doctor and be given a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors intuitively knew is what now is the view of the World Health Organization after reviewing the best research, which is that our pain makes sense. That actually you know, as the World Health Organization puts it, you know, mental health is produced socially. It has so, it's a social indicator and it requires social as well as individual solutions. And so that story Derek told me about the cow really showed to me the reorientation we need to make as a culture, right? Which is actually what the depressed and anxious people I love need. What I needed when I was a teenager is for someone to sit with them, listen to the reason why they're distressed, see that it makes sense and begin to solve those problems. Now, some of those problems are very big. I could, I'll give you an example of one if you like. Um, you know, some of those problems are very big. Some of them are, you know, uh, can only be changed by big social changes. Some of them can be changed more by individuals. <clears throat> but, but if we if we don't have that conversation, if we remain stuck, and I understand why people are reluctant to have a conversation that that shifts the story about their pain and distress, because if you, because I felt it, if you've got a story about your pain. Even if it's not working very well, what that does is it structures your life and it structures how you think about your pain. And I remember when I when I when I first started interviewing Irving Kirsch, Professor Irving Kirsch at Harvard, who's shown that the drug company trials, um, which was later established in court as entirely true, that the 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 that the drug companies had grossly missold these drugs. Uh, so for, I mean, it was really shocking for me to be shown by Irving one of the leaked emails from within the drug company for the drug that I was given, Siroxat, in which they admitted that they don't work for teenagers. And bear in mind, I was given it when I was a teenager. But they said that would be, I think the phrase was, unacceptable for the commercial uh, profile of paroxetine. So they just carried on selling it anyway. And that's one of the things they had to make a big payout for in court in the end. It was it was shocking. And I think one of the reasons why people entirely understandably are upset is if they feel that the story about their pain is being taken away, you feel like it's almost like letting a monster off a leash, right? At least if you've got a story, you're putting the pain on some kind of leash. And if you let it off the leash, which is why so much of Lost Connections is about how we need this new story. Um, now, it's not 
it's new to us. No one told us. My doctor didn't tell me. But these are stories, this stuff that has been known in the scientific research, as the book makes clear, for a really long time. But the, 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 so I think I'll give you a specific example because it can sound a bit weird in the abstract. So I noticed that lots of people I know who are depressed and anxious, their depression and anxiety tends to center around their work. Not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people. Yeah. So I began to look at, is there any evidence about how, just looking for evidence about how people feel about their work, and that was where I started. Gallup did the most deep, the opinion poll company, did the most detailed study that's ever been done in loads of countries, including the United States and, and, and Britain, about, what, about how people feel about their work. What they found is 13% of us like our work. We enjoy it. We get energy from it most of the time. 63% of people are what they call sleepwalking through their work. They don't like it. They don't hate it. They're kind of enduring it. And 24% of people hate their work, fear it, dread it, makes them feel awful. And that, when I looked at it, I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty striking, right? Like that's, that's 13% of people who like what they're doing most of their waking life, and 87% of people who don't like it. You're almost twice as likely to hate your job as love your job. And this thing that we don't want to do is spreading over more and more of our lives. The average person now answers their first work email, I think it's 7.43 a.m., and leaves work at 7.15 p.m. And I started to think, well, could this be affecting people's mental health? So I started to dig into this and I discovered that an amazing Australian social scientist who I got to know, Professor Michael Marmot, had actually discovered the answer. I can tell you the story of how he discovered it, if you like, it's in the book, but I'll just go to the, the kind of headline finding. I think the story of how he discovered it is totally fascinating as well. But the headline finding is that Professor Marmot discovered, if you feel you have no control over your work, you are much more likely to become depressed. You're actually even more likely to have a stress-related heart attack. And I think, this is going a little bit beyond Professor Marmot, but I think that's because human beings have an innate need to feel that what we're doing is meaningful and has purpose. And if you are controlled all the time, it disrupts your ability to make meaning out of what you're doing. And anyway, and this opened up for me, one of the things that was so important about this is to think about how do we get out of that? Because for me, I didn't want to just find a diagnosis. I wanted to find solutions, right? And there's actually, I discovered this because initially I misunderstood what Mar Professor Marmot was telling me. Initially, I thought he was saying shit jobs make people depressed, mm -hmm. right? I thought he was saying, you know, so I thought about a lot of my relatives. My grandmother's job was to clean toilets. My, you know, my, my dad was a bus driver. My mum, my mother worked in a refuge for victims of domestic violence. You know, I, um, my sister is a, is a, is a nurse. My, my brother is a delivery person. And I was like, well, you know, not everyone is going to get to do a kind of fancy job, right? Actually, when I looked at it more, I spoke with Professor Marmot more, I was misunderstanding what he was saying. You can actually regain control at almost any, at, not almost, you can regain control at any level in any job. So, and I, I'll give you an example of someone who showed me how to do that. So in Baltimore, I met this woman called Meredith Keogh. Meredith used to go to bed every Sunday night, just sick with anxiety. She had an office job. It wasn't the worst office job in the world. She wasn't being bullied or anything, but it was monotonous and she was very controlled and she just couldn't bear the thought that this was going to be the next 40 years of her life. So Meredith did this quite bold thing with her husband, Josh. So Josh had worked in bike stores in Baltimore since he was a kid. And you know, bike stores in the US, it's very insecure work. You're controlled. Obviously, you just do whatever the boss tells you to. You don't get things like sick pay or holiday pay. Um, and you obviously get minimum wage or close to it. And Josh and his friends in the bike store one day just said, just ask themselves a question. What does our boss actually do? <laughs> they liked their boss. He wasn't a bad person, but they thought, we fix all the bikes. They decided to try this experiment. They set up with Meredith a bike store that ran on a different principle. They didn't have a boss. What they did is they ran it as a democratic cooperative. So they take all the big decisions together by voting. They share out the good jobs and the bad, the good tasks and the bad tasks. They um, share the profit, obviously. And it's a, it's a store called Baltimore Bicycle Works, thriving business. And one of the things that really interested me when I went there was talking to them and, real, and, and them saying how many of them, not all of them, but how many of them said they had been depressed and anxious when they worked in this previous controlled environments and now they, they still have bad days, of course, but they didn't feel depressed and anxious. And that was a real revelation for me because it's not like they quit their jobs fixing bikes, you know, and went and became Beyonce's backing singers, right? They quit their jobs. They, 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 they fixed bikes before and they fix bikes now. The difference is explained, the difference in how they feel is explained by Michael Marmot's research, which is 
they've, they've stripped out the cause of depression, which was the fact that they were being controlled. And to me, that should be thought of as an antidepressant, right? What I want to do is expand the concept of the antidepressant. That cow was an antidepressant. Democratizing that workplace was an antidepressant. And I go through lots of other scientific evidence for other kinds of antidepressant in the book, which I want to stress. I'm adding this to the menu that includes chemical antidepressants. I'm not taking anything off the menu. Well, I do think it's so important for people to realise that there are other options and it's not necessarily a case of just accepting a prescription. I think it's important because I think one of the things that I, I, I try to stress in the book as well is for a lot of people, there are no other options at the moment. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think part of the problem. So I think, for example, one of my relatives is a struggling single mum with two, two kids who she does an amazing job with. She's working flat out just to pay the rent. The idea of saying to her, well, your task now is to democratize your workplace, get a universal basic income to, you know, go through all these different things would be would be disgusting. Right. Actually. And we know this about other problems. We don't say that the job of solving car crashes lies on people who've already been in a car crash and, do and the doctors in the emergency room. Right. We say that the job for solving car crashes lies with everyone. That's why we have driving tests and seatbelts and airbags and we arrest people who drive when they're under the influence and, and all of that you know and we have a whole and we of course send ambulances for the people who've been in car crashes and all and we give them physiotherapy and in a similar way in a sense there will be people listening who at the moment because of the way our society has gone wrong do feel it's like either I take this prescription or I just feel terrible, right? Mm -hmm. And part of my argument is that we need to change our society so far more people have the ability to change their lives in the way I was able to change my life because I had money from my previous book, you know? And I think I want to be very careful because I think it's kind of cruel to say to people, hey, in this very American upbeat way, you know, hey, you can change your life. Actually, a lot of people can't change their lives if the way our society works. And that's why it's the job of everyone else to change the society so that they are able to change their lives. I don't want to get into, uh, and this is not the way you're putting it, but the, there's a danger of actually a kind of individualist empowering motivational speak will actually make depressed people feel even worse if they are in fact trapped. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly in the book, empowerment versus disempowerment is a real theme. And you mentioned Sir Michael Marmot. And there's a quote from him that really resonated with me, which is, disempowerment is at the heart of poor health, physical, mental, and emotional. And certainly, again, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, although I initially found that getting a diagnosis and being prescribed antidepressant drugs a solution, I came to view those things as quite disempowering in their own right. I was already a disempowered person, and I was being asked to accept that I had a broken brain and to rely on a medication, something external to me that I might need to rely on for life. So I became even less motivated to change things around me or to motivate myself. So I think with our current approach, we risk disempowering the disempowered even further. And that's really interesting. And I think that's, while that's not true for everyone, I do know lots of people who that was, that was true for. I think it also leads to other forms of actual physical disempowerment. And I think it's worth saying 75% of men who take chemical antidepressants experience some form of sexual dysfunction, which is a... Um, a kind of hard thing to talk about that's actually uh, in, in my case i i um experienced a quite common side effect which is that it took me it basically took me an extremely long time to to ejaculate which sounds like a good thing to, for a teenage boy but actually um just makes sex much less appealing it actually makes sex quite painful much less appealing um and it was only when i stopped taking the antidepressants and started having a much more kind of uh you know, enjoyable sex life again, that um, I realized what an incredibly powerful natural antidepressant sex is, you know. Um, so I think you're right that there are all sorts of ways in which, so there are people who have positive experiences with these drugs, their experiences are real, um, and we should honor that, those positive experiences as well. There are equally lots of people who have negative experiences with these drugs, and there are lots more people in the middle who experience a very modest benefit, mm. right, mm. along with real side effects, whether it's sexual dysfunction or in my case as well, enormous amount of weight gain, which again is a very, very common side effect, particularly with the paroxetine or Siroxat or Paxil, which are the different names for the drug that, the same drug that, that I took. I think you're right. And I, I think it goes back to what Rufus May told me, which is it's disempowering to tell people they're biologically broken when they're not. I also think, and this relates to another debate, and it's something I thought about very carefully when I was writing Lost Connections, which is about stigma. So what we've done is we've incredibly well-intentioned people, and I did this myself, have said the way out of stigma 
for depression and anxiety is to say depression is a disease like, you know, cancer and it's a physical problem. And just like you wouldn't, you know, shame someone for having cancer, you shouldn't shame someone for having depression. And I actually learned that that, that while some of the insights that that's intended to convey, like for example, the individual is not choosing it. It's not simply a matter of pulling yourself together are absolutely true. And of course they shouldn't be shamed. Actually that method of trying to overcome shame is, is really flawed. One of the first people to challenge me on that was this wonderful neuroscientist I interviewed called um, Professor Mark Lewis, who said to me, why, um, the exact words are on the website and in the book, but he said something like, why do you think that saying something is a disease gets rid of stigma. No one ever doubted that leprosy was a disease. No one ever doubted that AIDS was a disease. You might have noticed there was quite a lot of stigma against lepers and, and AIDS patients, and, and then, which I found really challenging. I thought, oh, wait. And then, and then actually, um, the thing that really kind of challenged me most was uh, this experiment that was done by Professor Sheila Mehta, who I interviewed. She's at the, uh, I think, the University of Alabama. So she did this experiment. So what happens is, if you were the participant in the experiment, what happens is you go into a room, and you sit down next to someone else who you think is just another person like you going to take part in the experiment. You don't realize this person is an actor. And you get chatting, and the person will mention in passing that they have a mental illness. And they'll either say they have a mental illness because of a biological problem, or they'll say they have a mental illness because of bad things that have happened to them. Then you go through, then you're taken through by a scientist into the lab, and you think this is the start of the experiment. And you're told that it's an experiment in to see how well people learn things. So you have to learn a pattern, I think it's on a computer, and then you have to teach, or it might be on some blocks, I can't remember. And then you, you have to teach the pattern to the other person who you don't know is an actor. And every time they get it wrong, you have to push a button. And the button will give them, you're told, a painful electrical shock. It won't kill them, it's not, not you know, like that, but it'll give them a painful electrical shock. And what the experiment was designed to figure out was, will there be a difference? If you think the person is, has a mental health problem because they have um, a problem with their biology, will you be more or less likely to shock them than if you think, they, you think they've, just, they've got a mental health problem because of bad things that have happened to them? What they found was that you were significantly more likely to electrocute them and you electrocuted them for longer if you thought they had this problem for a biological reason. So mm -hmm. far from reducing stigma, the biological story actually increased it. And I think that's for a kind of simple reason, which is if it's a biological story, then what you're saying is this person is broken in a way that's very different to you. And they're always going to be broken. And that's just, there's just a natural difference between you and them. Whereas if you're saying it's because of bad things that have happened to them, that's actually saying this is a person just like you. And this thing that's happened to this person could happen just as easily to you. And I think that's, that's, that is one of the reasons why this different story that I'm trying to convey to people, that the causes of depression and anxiety largely lie in the fact that our underlying psychological needs are not being met, I think that's, that's, that's a much more destigmatizing story. Not least because for every person who's being made fully depressed by the fact that they're controlled at work, for example, to pick one of the nine causes, there's far more people who are made really unhappy by it or just a bit unhappy by it. And actually that what that does is that if we're fighting against the causes of unhappiness and depression and anxiety in our society, that's something where pretty much everyone is affected by them, right? Not just the people who develop full-blown depression. What that does is it makes us all allies against these things rather than being a kind of broken minority who deserve pity and a bit of compassion. You actually become kind of people who are showing what's actually screwing over almost everyone. I think you're right. It's incredibly powerful to see where we join as people and where we can agree rather than analysing and compartmentalising differences. And I really enjoyed the story of Cotty in the book in terms of people being initially fearful of difference, but then uniting through a common cause and coming to accept that although people there had such different values and ways of living, actually the things that motivated and drove them at their core were actually very similar. And that led to a great deal of connection. And that part of the book really resonated with me. Yeah, I learned so much from the book from social scientists, but actually I would absorbed a lot of it intellectually and I found a lot of it very challenging. And a lot of it really fell into place for me when I went to Berlin uh, to, to stay with a friend of mine, uh, my friend, the writer Kate McNaughton. And I, and, I, and I kind of stumbled across this place and I learned about what happened there. So in the summer of 2011, before I went there, 
on a big anonymous housing project in, in Berlin, a woman put a sign in her window. She was a woman in her early 60s. She's called Nuria Chengish. She's a Muslim woman in a wheelchair. And she clambered out of her wheelchair. And the sign that she put in her window said something like, I'm being evicted from my apartment. So next Thursday, I'm going to kill myself. And this is a big anonymous housing project in Berlin um, where no one really knew each other. And people start to kind of, and actually, because it was a very poor area, basically the residents were a mixture of um, Turkish immigrants, gay people and squatting punks, punk squatters, uh, all of whom kind of these three communities kind of looked at each other with a bit of, you know, bemusement. People started to knock on Nuria's door and they said, do you need some help? And Nuria said, no, I don't want any help. I'm going to kill myself and shut the door in their face. And rents had been rising across Berlin, particularly in this neighborhood for a while. And people were really pissed off about their rents going up and, and they got chatting and they, they had this idea. There's a big thoroughfare into the center of Berlin, into Mitte, just in, in Cotty, this, this neighborhood, which is just outside the housing project. And they said, well, maybe if we just blocked the street for a day uh, and we wheel Nuria out to sit in the middle of it and we just block the road and make a fuss, the media will probably come. They'll probably let Nuria stay in her home. So they did it. And Nuria came out and she just kind of thought, well, I'm going to kill myself anyway. I've got nothing to lose. And they stood there for a day and the media did come and it was a bit of a fuss. And then at the end of the day, the police came along and basically said, you've had your fun, take it down. And the residents were kind of a bit outraged. They said, well, hang on. You haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. And actually, all of us want a rent freeze. We can't go on like this. And they realized that the police would just take it all down the minute they left. So they, one of the women there, Tanya, who I love, she's, a, she's one of the squatters. She, she, Tanya wears a, a tiny miniskirt, even in like Berlin winters, which is really hardcore. Um, Tanya said, Tanya happened to have in her apartment a uh, klaxon, one of those things that makes a really loud noise. And she said, well, what I'll do is I'll bring down my klaxon we should all sign up to man this barricade. And if the police come to take it down, let off the klaxon and we'll, we'll all flood, you know, we'll all flood down and stop them. So people who didn't know each other on this big housing project start just signing up to do the night shift, right? Or the day shift or, so Tanya and Nuria were paired together. You know, Nuria is a very conservative Muslim in a hijab. Tanya is in a tiny mini skirt with a lot of tattoos. And they sit there through the night and at first, it was very, first few times, it was very awkward. And they start talking and they, Nuria and Tanya realized how much they had in common, that they had both been, well, Nuria had come to Koti when she was 17 years old from this tiny village in Turkey. She brought her two kids with her and her job was to raise enough money doing every job she could to send back for her husband. And after she'd been there for a year, she got word that her husband had died. And she, she, she was suddenly stranded with these two kids in this country where she barely spoke the language. She told Tanya something she'd never told anyone, which is that she'd always told people her husband died of a heart attack. He'd actually died of tuberculosis, which is a, regarded as a disease of poverty. And then Tanya told Nuria about how she had ended up in Koti. She'd been thrown out by her middle-class parents. She'd run away to live in a squat when she was 15. She got pregnant. Actually, she had been on her own in Koti with her child, with no one to help her at the same age, almost the same age that Nuria had been. They started realizing how, how similar they were all over Koti, these kinds of connections were happening. There was a young lad called Mehmet, who was a kind of Turkish kid who loved hip hop. He was paired with this grumpy old white communist guy. They became really good friends. These, these connections were forming everywhere. And many amazing things happened at Koti, and I go through them in, in the book. And, and, and uh, the story is complex and extraordinary. But one of the things that really moved me, so in Berlin, you can trigger a referendum if you get signatures of the citizens. They got the largest number of signatures to trigger a referendum in the history of the city of Berlin. And the city council gave in and conceded a lot of what they wanted. But when I went to go and see Nuria, the last time I saw her, she said to me something like, I'm really glad I got to stay in my neighborhood, but I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by all these amazing people all along and I never knew. And I remember one of the other Turkish women, Neriman, said to me one day when I was talking to her, she was talking about when she'd grown up in Turkey, she grew up in a village and she called the whole village home. And then she came to Germany and she learned that in the Western world, what we call home is just our apartment or our house. And she said to me, when these protests began, 
this whole place became my home again. And she realized that she had been homeless all this time she'd lived in the Western world. And in a sense, we're all homeless because the idea of home that we have, which is just our family, if we're lucky, is not big enough for what human beings need to feel we belong. We evolved in hunter-gatherer tribes, very like Cotty, right? We evolved to live with hundreds of other people who we are helping and who are helping us the whole time. And we live such atomized, broken up lives. And we imagine that screaming at each other through screens is a replacement for that kind of connection when it really isn't. And I went to the first ever internet rehab center in the United States to learn all about that. But for me, the thing I felt, that was, it was in Cotty that these insights, I felt most strongly, Nuria and Tanya and all those other people didn't need to be drugged, they needed to be together. And it was the solution, and lots of them had been drugging themselves prior to you know the, 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 the protest happening. And Tanya said to me, I remember sitting outside Cotty one day with her, she said to me, when you are shut away, the audio is on the website for exact words, but something like, when you're shut away and you're alone and you feel like shit, you think it's just you. But then you come out of your corner fighting and you realize it's not just me. All these people around me feel the same way. And when you come out, when you stop crying and you come out of your corner fighting, you stop feeling weak and you start feeling strong. And, I, and this is one of the things I really learned that in one sense, the struggle is the solution. They didn't actually get what they were fighting for for several years, but the act of coming together to fight for it was in itself a really potent antidepressant for them. And there's lots of that fits with lots of social science evidence I later learned about. So to me, Cotty shows how unethical it would have been to tell them that they felt the way they did because they had a chemical imbalance in their brains. I felt that so strongly there. It's when it, it's when it emotionally clicked into place for me. Again, it comes across as so powerful when people gave each other time to tell and understand each other's stories rather than assuming they knew what was happening for a person. Yeah, I think that's totally true. And to realise James Baldwin, one of my favourite writers, said something like, the only use for your pain is if it can help you to understand other people's pain. And if it can do that, it can help you to overcome it. And I think that's so true that we are a social species. The only reason why you, you and I exist is because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the things they took down. They weren't, you know, they were, they were much better at cooperating. Every instinct human beings have is to live as cooperative tribes. Just like bees need a hive, humans need a tribe. And we are the first humans to ever try living without a tribe. There's this amazing uh, study that asks, it's very simple, just ask Americans, how many close friends do you have who you, can call, who you can call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer, it's not the uh, it's not majority who say this, but the most common answer is none. And you think about what is life like if you are on your own and, there, and, and you feel a crisis is coming? And for example, one of the people who took part in the protest at Koti, a guy called Tunkai, was carried away to a psychiatric hospital. And the whole of the Koti protest movement descended on the psychiatric hospital to demand that he be given back to them and to say, well, we love him. He belongs with us. And I remember the shock in the psychiatric hospital. They were completely baffled that suddenly this like bizarre impromptu <laughs> army of like Muslims in hijabs, gay people and punks had turned up to demand. This had never happened in there. They'd never known anything like that. Um, you know, their solution was to put him away in a padded cell when there were all these people saying, but we love him. He belongs with us. And it made me think, you know, how many of us, if we were carted off to a psychiatric institution, would have hundreds of people saying, no, we want him back. We'll look after him. You know, in a very atomized, isolated society where people are taught that life is about money and status and they're encouraged to scream at each other through screens, that is going to be a very depressed and anxious society for very good reasons. And it's not because the individuals have broken brains. Well, that moment with Tunkai kind of epitomized the whole book for me. The medical establishment was trying to isolate him. It was trying to drug him, trying to put him in a padded cell, trying to exclude him from society. And yet the people that he'd connected with wanted desperately to get him back. And that moment so clearly showed the power of connection. So that with so many of the problems that people had. So, for example, I mentioned Mehmet, right? Yeah. Mehmet was this young Turkish lad. He must have been about 16 when the protest started. And he kept being nearly thrown out of school. They kept saying he had ADHD, right? 
And actually what happened when the protest began is loads of people just started helping him. Older people started helping him with his homework and listening to him. This grumpy old guy, communist guy who was paired up with him, just helped him with it. And it turned out he did much better at school. Again, it's not that he had some biological thought in his brain. He needed people to pay attention to him for him to then model attention in the world. And so many problems that are insoluble when you are an isolated individual become soluble when you're part of a group that wants to support you. Answers that you can't see when you're on your own become visible when you, well, I'll give you an example, think about, I mentioned before Dr. Sam Everington, who set up this idea of social prescribing, right? Where he prescribes all these depressed and anxious people to take part in, in this gardening program. One of the things that happened is the depressed and anxious people got to know each other. And there was one guy in the group who uh, was actually homeless. He was sleeping on a bus. All the other depressed people were so outraged that he was sleeping on a bus that they started fighting for the local council, r- ringing them up and demanding that he gets a, an apartment, which they, which they, the council then did because they were pressured, right? Again, he couldn't have done that on his own. But when you've got a lot of people looking out for you, you, your problems become much more accessible and soluble. And that's not the only kind of solution. I go through lots of other solutions as well. I do think it's one of the, the core ones. A lot of the pathologies we're experiencing, not all, and not every aspect of this pathology, these these problems are, you know, as apparent pathologies, I should say. They are they are signals that we're not living in ways that are compatible with our human nature. You know, there was this really interesting study, it made me think a lot more about Cotty, by a academic I went to go and interview in Berkeley in California. She's called Brett Ford, Dr. Brett Ford. And Brett did this interesting research with her colleagues at Berkeley where what they looked at is quite a simple thing in a way. They looked at If you consciously decided to spend more hours of the day trying to be happier, would you in fact become happier? And they looked at four countries. It was, uh, I don't get this wrong, it's the US, uh, Japan, Russia, and Taiwan. And what they found is if you consciously try to make yourself happier in the United States, you do not become happier. But in the other countries, if you consciously try to become happier, you do. And they were like, what's going on? So they looked at this in more detail. And what they discovered was, in the US, I'm pretty sure this would be true of Britain as well, if you try to make yourself happier, what you do most of the time is you do something for yourself. You try to, and this was certainly my, the case with me when I was felt depression coming on to me, you try to big yourself up, you try to achieve something, you try to you know, buy something for yourself. You do something for yourself, self-oriented. In the other countries, when people consciously tried to make themselves happier, they did something for someone else. They did something for their family, their friends, their community. Not every time, but most of the time. So we have an implicit idea of happiness, which is that it's about the individual. They have an implicit idea of happiness that it's about the group. And our idea of happiness, it turns out, isn't just isn't that compatible with human nature. If that's not how you make yourself happy, it doesn't work. Whereas a more collective model of happiness, which is, and I, and I began to think, well, that's what I saw at Cotty. There was a flip from an individualist model of happiness to a collective model of happiness. And I've tried to apply this in my own life. So it used to be when I would feel, start feeling, you know, distressed or anxious feelings, I would do something for myself. Now I try to make, even when I don't feel like it, I try to make myself do something for someone else. And it's really striking to me how much more effective it is. And also how incredibly easy it is in such a lonely and cut-off society. It is so easy to make other people feel better. Just go and listen to them. <laughs> Just go and sit and ask them some questions. People are thrilled to have, be paid attention to. You know, and actually, you know, I had this this week, um, I found out that somebody I wrote about in my previous book, Chasing the Scream, has had a real, uh, an extraordinary and amazing person has had a, a real um, emotional and mental health crisis. And unfortunately, she's in a uh, she's in a part of the United States I'm not going to in the next few months. Otherwise, I'll go and sit with her. But I thought, what could I do to help? And I actually thought about another experiment that I learned about for the book. I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll give her some money because actually she's not got any money and that will make her feel better. And one of the things that I learned about from that is that the, the, this is a really interesting experiment that was done in Canada in the 1970s. So um, the Canadian government knew they had a welfare state but also that there were flaws and problems. So they chose this town, as far as I can tell, at random. It's a place called Dauphin in in Manitoba. Um, uh, It's about four hours out of Winnipeg, for anyone who knows Canada. And they basically said to a big group of people in this town, from now on, 
we are going to give you a guaranteed basic income. No matter what happens, we're going to give you the equivalent of about $17,000 in today's money. And there is nothing you can do that will mean that we take this money away from you. And they wanted to see what happened. So I interviewed Dr. Evelyn Forget, who did this long-term research on, into it. And they found loads of interesting things. Parents spent more time with their kids. St- students stayed at school longer. Uh, p- people turned down, people didn't work less, but they felt more empowered to turn down shitty jobs. But actually the most interesting thing for me was there was a really significant fall in mental health problems. Mental health problems that were so severe people had to be hospitalized fell by 9%. Now, if you could find a drug that would reduce mental health problems by 9%, I guarantee people would be all over that as well. And, and as Dr. Forger put it to me, it's an antidepressant, right? One reason why people feel bad is financial insecurity, can't provide for things. If you give people that baseline of security, they're much less likely to become depressed. So I thought about that in relation to this, this person I knew from my previous book. And actually, you know, I've had a nice week. My book's doing really well. You know, the thing that has most made me feel good this week is actually helping her. And that's really a lesson that I learned from all these different people, from Cotty, from Brett Ford, from so much of the science I looked at from Professor John Cassiopo, the expert on loneliness. Just the incredible power of helping someone else is, is, is enormous. It's, it's what we're all about. And it's an incredible victory of the propaganda system we live under that we've been made to kind of neglect that. And we've been made to, 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 to defy our own nature. Of course, selfishness is also in our nature. Of course, we're a complex mixture of things. But to so deeply neglect, I mean, I don't mean this as a glib point. A society that would elect Donald Trump, a man whose reaction to his own brother killing himself with alcoholism was to take his brother's widow and disabled child to court to cut them out of the family estate. You know, a man who celebrates cruelty and is so obviously himself achingly unhappy, that is also a symptom of this deep malaise. Now, I don't say this to, I'm strongly against patronizing or condescending to Trump voters, who um, I've I've spent a lot of time with, and who are sending us a signal that life has become intolerable to them. And we should really respect that signal. Now, I do not respect the actions of Donald Trump, which I think are horrendous. But I respect the fact, I mean, when I was in in the run-up to the election, I was in Cleveland doing research. And at one point, I, I went out with this group of people, who, a wonderful group of people who were doing get-out-the-vote work in a very poor part of Cleveland. And there was this woman we spoke to who's um, absolutely haunted by something. She said, we were on this big, long street where a third of the houses have been demolished, a third were abandoned, and a third still had people living in them, literally behind barbed wire in some cases. And we knocked on one door, and there was a woman who, from looking at her, I would have guessed was 60, Actually, I learned from talking to her, she was the same age as me at that time, 37. And she was very angry, quite articulate. Uh, she actually knew quite a lot. And we were talking, and she just didn't want to hear anything about childcare tax credits or something. I mean, it was like, it was like you're talking for another planet. And she said she made this, this verbal slip. She was talking about what the area used to be like. And she, she meant to say when I was young. But what she actually said is when I was alive. And it really hit me like a thump, right? That's how she feels. That's how a lot of people feel. And the idea that the way to respond to that is to call people like her stupid or racist or that is unbelievable. Well, first, it's not true. Uh, She's not stupid. She's not racist. And secondly, that will deepen the humiliation of, of her. What we need to do is really respect and listen to her and get her the help she needs to actually have her psychological needs met. And these pathology, and I do think Trump is a pathology, and I do think Brexit is pathology, and Marine Le Pen, and Alternative for Deutschland, and all these right-wing um, movements that are rising, they are distress signals, right? Mm-hmm. And if we don't listen to that distress signal, we're going to get a lot more and a lot louder distress signals, and I think we know in history where that leads. So we need to start start dealing with this, this now. And I do think you know, there's this great line, uh, the Indian philosopher Krishnamurti said, it's no sign of good health to be well adjusted to a sick society. And I have thought of that all through the rise of Trump, uh, who I thought all along was going to win. I actually wrote an article in 2011 saying, weirdly, I thought he would win. Well, the answers to this are complex and take time to understand, don't they? And I kind of feel that we're in trouble, partly because we've wanted a magic bullet. We've wanted a quick fix, and we haven't necessarily been prepared to go on the long, rambling journey to look at our values and our culture and our society and communities and everything else that you describe beautifully in the book. I think you're right. that, that And I, I felt this very strongly when I started looking at this research. I was like, yeah, okay, so the pills didn't work for me. I want something like a pill, right? I want a 
a solution that I could, that will take me 30 seconds in the morning and then I can carry on with the atomized materialistic life I was living. And actually I totally understand because when you're in pain, you just want the pain to go away mm. well, quite rightly. You don't, you know, if you've broken your arm, you don't want to be having some philosophical debate about the ne- the ne- circumstances in which arms get broken. You're just like, give me some painkillers, right? And I, and I understand that. But the truth is the solutions that are pills have a modest effect or no effect for most people, right? It's not that they have are worthless. They're not. A modest effect is better than nothing. Uh, and there are plenty of people who have a modest effect. It, for him, it has a mos- modest positive effect. But it's not dealing with the cause of the depression and therefore it need, we need to complement that with solutions that do deal with the causes and those causes are big but i've lived through incredible transformations i mean i'm gay i tell the story in my book of, of one of my closest friends andrew sullivan in 1994 andrew had been diagnosed as hiv positive this is the height of the aids epidemic his best friend had just died of aids and andrew left his job he'd been the editor of the new republic of a prominent magazine and he went to Provincetown, this little gay town on the edge of Cape Cod, to die, basically. He thought he was about to die. And he decided that the last thing he was going to do was write a book. It's called Virtually Normal, with an absolutely ludicrous premise, an idea that he regarded as crazy, but he thought maybe generations down the line people would pick it up. The idea he was the first person to ever propose in a book was gay marriage. And when I get discouraged, I think, oh, God, these are big fights. The things I'm proposing are sometimes big changes. I tried to imagine going back in time and saying to Andrew, okay, going back to 1994 and saying, Andrew, I've got to tell you a few things. Firstly, 25 years from now, you're going to be alive. Good news. 25 years from now, the Supreme Court of the United States is going to quote the book you're writing in a legal judgment declaring gay marriage for the entire United States. And I'll be with you soon after when you receive a letter from the President of the United States who will have lit up the White House in the colours of the rainbow flag inviting you to have dinner with him at the White House to celebrate what you've achieved. Oh, and by the way, that president is going to be black, right? That would have sounded like the most ludicrous science fiction, but it happened. Incredible transformations can happen when people band together, they appeal to each other's sense of kindness and goodness and decency. And and I'm in many ways optimistic about the transformation we can have. We are in a big crisis. The crisis is apparent to everyone. Even Trump supporters voted for him because they thought that it would solve a crisis, right? There's very people who think things are just on a normal, even keel and we're all sailing along nicely. And that is frightening, but it's also empowering because in a crisis, things have to change. Now, if we don't organize in the right way, if we don't understand what's happening in the right way, that crisis will take the form of further deterioration. But if we understand it correctly and we fight in the right way and we appeal to each other through love and compassion to deal with the causes of depression and anxiety, then that will take the form of um, a transformation that will improve everyone's life. And really, it's up to us now about whether which which choice we make. Absolutely. Well, Johan, again, I just want to thank you because I feel that Lost Connections is such a good blueprint for the transformation that we need to make. And it's so nice to see the psychological and social evidence brought together. Your book acts as an excellent focal point for those conversations that are a world away from the drugs and the biology. We've kind of discussed those things to death and yet achieved so little. So thank you for pulling everything together and allowing those conversations to happen. Oh, thank you very much. I should say, um, anyone who wants any more information, they can go to the book's website, which is www.thelostconnections.com. There you can listen to audio interviews with people at Cotty and loads of other places, uh, loads of the scientists that I spoke to. You can um, take a quiz to see how much you know about the real causes of depression and anxiety. You can find out where to buy the book. The audio book is available from audible.com. You can follow me on Twitter. It's J-O-H-A-N-N-H-A-R-I-1-0-1. You can follow the book on Facebook at facebook.com slash The Lost Connections. You can follow me on Instagram. It's J-O-H-A-N-N dot H-A-R-I. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you today. I really, really appreciate you engaging so deeply with the subject. And I know this is very important in your life as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful. Well, Lost Connections really resonated with me because I recognized so much of my own experience in it. And I'm so keen that we accept the limitations of the drugs, but instead of just arguing with psychiatrists about whether they work or not, what's far more healthy is to discuss what more we can do in our society and our communities to make life better for everyone, not just for pharmaceutical company shareholders. That's such a good way of putting it. That's such a good way of putting it. 
Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm so grateful to Johan for giving up so much of his time to talk with me for the podcast. And as a reminder, to find out more about the book, you can visit www.thelostconnections.com. Thank you so much for listening. And if you want to get in touch or give us feedback, you can use the email podcasts at madinamerica.com. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 